As I said last week, we were taking a break uh, from the book of Acts, from our journey through the, the book of Acts. And so we're going to look at uh, several passages this month in uh, 1 Corinthians, uh, the book of 1 Corinthians, and some difficult passages, some, very, some passages that some churches may not even want to look upon. But I think it's good for us to study them and to know what the Lord, Word of, of God has to say. So last week, we talked about singleness and uh, singleness and the gospel and what singleness means to us and uh, uh, single, uh, singleness as a, as a recap, singleness is a, is a gift, uh, just as marriage is a gift that God gives us gifts to bless the body of Christ and uh, the church and singleness uh, can use their gifts or singles can use their gifts and freedom to serve with undivided devotion uh, to the Lord. I heard as a result of the sermon last week, a 14-year-old said, I'm going to be single. Praise the Lord. But uh, uh, singleness is not the waiting room for marriage. Singleness is not the waiting room for marriage where you're going to go from joy, from agony to joy. Singleness is a place where God has called you at this specific season of your life to be, to be a blessing to the church. Um, and so today, uh, we're going to look at married life, married, marriage, and, uh, and its joy and its despairs. There are difficult times and there are moments of joy and there are moments of bliss and, and happiness. And so uh, I want to be able to share this with us, with you. Right? So every year about 200,000 couples in Malaysia get married every year. The statistics I think was 2016. Um, every year also 50,000 marriages uh, fail. They go to, to the divorce. And so that's about 137 per day. Just in this one hour of our service, 11 couples have already signed their marriage uh, divorce papers and uh, divorced. 11 couples in a year. And so we know that the family unit is breaking down and it is not, it is not uh, something that Christians are immune to, Christians to suffer. And so we want to know why. Why is it that marriage is so hard? Why is it that, that marriage, marriages fail? Um, and I think there is a biblical uh, explanation for this. There has to be if we really believe that marriage is from God and that marriage is a gift from God, then it has to be, there has to be a solution to this. There, this is not the way it is supposed to be, obviously. And so let's look at the scripture and see what the Bible has for us as we look at the history of marriage. It doesn't work, Titus? Okay. Uh, the history of marriage. We have to look at the first marriage, okay? Uh, the first marriage of Adam and Eve. And how God had made, the, in Genesis 1 and 2, the first marriage, uh, taking the rib from the man and creating the woman and, it was, and, sh- and to be a helpmate to the man. But then we know sin entered the world. And we know that from there, um, things went south. They went wrong. And, uh, and if we look at Genesis 3.16, as a result of the fall, the, God had pronounced a uh, curses, which was really the... The, the consequence of sin, all right? And, um, and so if, let, I, if you have your Bible's Genesis 3.16, or it's up here also, to the woman he said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing, and in pain you shall bring forth children. So one of the curses, or one of the consequences of sin is that there will be pain in childbearing. Um, but there is also this, that your desire shall be contrary to your husband but he shall rule over you. Your desire shall be for your husband in some versions, um, and his will be to rule over you. Now you think to yourself when you see this, that's a, that's a good thing, right? It sounds like a good thing, that the woman will have natural sexual desire for her husband, but then that is not what the curse is. And I think the, the, the key to unlock this is in a chapter later, in Genesis chapter 4, verse 3 to 7, or verse 6 to 7, when God speaks to Cain because Cain was not happy. And so in Genesis chapter 4, verse 6 to 7, if you read, uh, it says, The Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? And why has your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. And then listen to this. Its desire is for you. But you will rule over it. So here it so here, Moses, uh, author of Genesis, probably said that 
uh, or God <laughs> said this, that God said this, that sin is crouching in the dark. Sin is like an animal. It's like the crouching tiger, hidden dragon, right? Uh, at your door and it's ready to pounce onto you. And then it says that it is, it is there to dominate you, to pounce on you, to rule over you. Um, and the word for can also be translated in, in, in the Hebrew against. In, in some of your uh, ESV Bibles, it would say that. And so, uh, if we take this as the key to unlock Genesis 3, the very same words, uh, that, that is that, um, that sin is crouching at the door, its desire is for you. Its desire is to rule over you, to dominate you, to take over that leadership, take over your life. And so if you take it back to Genesis chapter 3, verse 16, to the woman, he said, your desire shall be for your husband and he shall rule over you. Her heart will be to rebel against God, against what is good. She will resist to submit under her husband. And according to the Bible, this is part of that sin nature. That the, that the wife will want to dominate, will want to rule over, will want to push him in place of her leadership to subdue and to take over. But that is not all. That the husband will then desire to rule and to rule in a way, in a leadership that is not godly, that is self-centered, that is selfish. All right? How many wives here find it hard to trust your husband's leadership? In fact, how many wives here struggle to trust your husband, period? You know, I think there's a strong cultural sin, and maybe even in America, but cultural sin in our Asian families. And out of my observation, let me uh, correct me if I'm wrong, that Asian women have been shown from history, from uh, past generations, and either reinforced by their grandmothers or their mothers, that men cannot be trusted. I don't know if you older ladies have your grandmother or your mother told you this. Men cannot be trusted. You have to be independent. You have to go find your own, you know, find your own source of income because you know, he's going to go out and have affairs and then he's going to marry someone else and then you're left with your children with nothing. And so we are, we are conditioned to think this way, isn't it? You have to fend for yourself. You have to be independent. Keep your own account because when he leaves you, at least you can still survive. This distrust between men and women and in our marriages can come out sometimes in manipulation of our husbands by either simply throwing tantrums and anger tantrums or, or even moving to the other end of tears and, and sadness and then, you know, and even holding of sexual, holding away sexual intimacy. You know, and, and this, is, this is how uh, marriages sometimes work. I know some families struggle and couples break up because of this sin. Because your desire shall be to dominate your husband. That's just the human fallen nature. And I think it's in all of us. And then the second part, he shall rule over you. The husband too... Uh, as a result of the fall, will seek to rule over the wife. The loving leadership of the husband will be replaced with the desire to rule, to master, uh, to exercise a kind of lordship over. And it is a leadership that dominates, that bullies, that is abusive, that is self-centered. Sin will be crouching at your, the husband's door as well, seeking to overtake him, seeking to devour Hence, in our marriages today, we see a sort of a power play, isn't it? A very subtle power play. And after many years of marriage, you know how to dance that kind of power play. Back and forth. Uh, and this is this fighting because men and women respond to their sinful nature. There is no oneness, no sense of one flesh as the Bible sees it. Families struggle and experience a lack of joy. And you here may be a part of a family like this, where where there's fighting and temper trolling, when there's a lack of walking in the Spirit or the way God has intended it to be, there is anger and temper throwing and maybe dishes throwing or furniture throwing. I don't know what it is. But let me say this, brothers and sisters, that this is marriage under the curse. This is a marriage that is under the curse of Genesis 3.16. And you understand now why this is so. Why is it that you struggle in your marriage? 
because of Genesis 3, 16, because of the curse, because of the fallen nature of man. But, it, but surely if God, if marriage is as God intended it to be, if it, surely if marriage is God's gift to, to the church, it shouldn't be this way. There has to be another way. And there is. And there is. Because marriage is God's idea. And the second is that Je Jesus came to redeem this and to make marriage a blessing and the purpose to which your marriage is to serve. And the key is in, is in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22 to 31, which we're going to read right now. Ephesians chapter 5, you have a Bible. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 5, verse 32, 22 to 31. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body and is himself its saviour. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound. And I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. First of all, notice how many times it says here in this passage that it's referring to a relationship between the husband and wife and Christ and the church. Okay, look at verse 24. As the wife, as the wife submits to, to the to the as wife submits to the husband, the church submits to Christ. Uh, verse 25. Uh, so wives submit to your husbands as Christ loved the church. Verse 25. Husbands love your wife as Christ does the church. And in verse 29, so shall you become one flesh, just as Christ is with the church. See, your marriage is to be a sample, a shadow, a miniature of the relationship between Christ and the church. Not the other way around. Uh, okay. um, and, and I want to just quote uh, John Piper in his book, Momentary Marriage, which is a great book if you ever get a chance to read it. He says this, that the ultimate thing we can say about marriage is that it exists for God's glory. That is, it exists to display God. Your marriage is there to display God. Now we see how marriage is patterned after Christ's covenant relationship to His redeemed people, the church. And therefore, the highest meaning and the ultimate purpose of marriage is to put the covenant relationship of Christ and His church on display. This is why marriage exists. If you are married, that is why you are married. If you hope to be singles, that should be your dream. That marriage puts on display the glory of God. Your marriage, your relationship puts on display the gospel of Jesus Christ. You remember last week I quoted Sam Albury, if, if marriage is the shape of the gospel, singleness shows its, its sufficiency. Shows its sufficiency. So marriage is the shape of the gospel. And why is marriage the shape of the gospel? Because it reflects the gospel. It reflects Christ and the church. You know, uh, I, I, w I had the opportunity to visit uh, an old friend, some of you know him, Luke, uh, in Holland, and he took us to the Madurodam, which is a miniature city in, in The Hague. And it is a, a picture of the whole world, really, in little cities. Uh, some of you may have been to places like this. I think there's one in Legoland, in Johor. Uh, there is the windows to the world in Shenzhen. Uh, where they have miniature cities, right? And there is perhaps one of Kuala Lumpur. And, and in many of these cities, there are twin, the, the icon of Kuala Lumpur is the Twin Towers. And you look at it and you know that it's Kuala Lumpur because that's the icon. But at the same time, you look at it and you know you are not in Kuala Lumpur because, it's, because of its size and its depiction that is not quite the real thing. But when you, come, when you go to KLCC in Kuala Lumpur, you know you are in Kuala Lumpur because of its height and its splendor and its beauty. It's the same with marriage. 
our marriage represents and shines a light, a very faint shadow of the beauty of the gospel of Jesus Christ, of His love for His church. The same is with this, with our redeemed gospel-infused marriages. It shows us the shape of the gospel, how Christ leads and loves the church and how the church submits to Christ. And so we will look a bit closer at this next week when we deal with biblical manhood and womanhood. But Ephesians 5 suggests three areas that God has redeemed our marriage through the gospel of Jesus Christ. In essence, reversing the curse. Next slide, please. In essence, it's reversing the curse. So you have Genesis 3.16, you have the curse that was proclaimed because of the fall. But the cross of Jesus Christ reverses this curse in Ephesians 5. In Ephesians 5, Paul, specifically with the mind of Genesis 3, tells us how this is reversed. And there are three points to this. Number one, wives can and should su willingly submit to a husband in all things. Wives can and willingly submit to a husband in all things to be dealt with in the next week. All right, I'll look at it, verse 22 and 24. Number two, husbands can love the wife as Christ loved the church for the purpose of sanctification. Verse 25 to 27. And the third is that husband and wife can become one flesh as Christ and the church is one. Verse 28 to 33. You see how specifically Ephesians 5 addresses Genesis 3 in every area. The curse was that her desire will be against her husband. She will dominate. But the gospel reverses that, this to say that Jesus, that just as Christ is head over the church and the church submits to Christ, so wives should submit in everything to their husbands. I know this is hard, wives. I know this is hard. You're, 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 the man you're married to is so short of, of so many things. So... Uh, uh, deficient in so many areas, right? And, and, and you know what? If you, if you trust him, you give him too much rope, he's going to take advantage of you or let you down at any moment of time, right? That's what goes through our minds. Well, let me say this. Would you take the risk of submitting wholeheartedly to the man God has given you and put in your life and whatever is short in his life, whatever is shortcoming, his debt that he owes to you, Whatever disappointments you may have of him because of his weakness or shortcomings, would you charge it all to Christ? Would you charge it all to Christ? Take the disappointments and the debt that you feel so deep, the hurt, the lacking, take it to, the, to Christ because Christ has paid for his deficiency. Because Christ has paid for whatever is lacking already in his life. You see, the reality is that Christ redeemed your husband, you and your marriage. It's a tripartite agreement. And whatever his shortcomings are, Christ has redeemed it. Christ has purchased the shortcomings, the debt. And so you're asked to trust him, to submit to him in everything as to the Lord. And as I said, I'll look closer at this next week. This is not just for wives though. As the part of the curse is the second part that he will rule over you. So husbands, you are to love your wives as Christ loved the church. Not lording over or bullying or any selfish purposes, which is as a result of the fall, but how did Christ love the church? He gave himself for the church. He suffered shame on the cross for the church. Husbands, you are to do the same to your wives. Christ gave himself up for the church, so we are to do this for our wives. Tim Keller says, So while our culture sees the purpose of marriage as personal satisfaction, the Bible says that the purpose of marriage is personal sanctification. Marriage, you see, is the best way, best possible way to learn about our sin and progress in knowledge of the gospel. Before I got married, I thought I was God's gift to humankind. Not really. But after I got married, I realized I was God's gift, but a very broken gift. Marriage, therefore, is a vehicle for helping our spouse become his or her best sanctified self through sacrificial, selfless service. It is to help our wives or our spouse to become what God intends 
him or her to be at the coming, at the fulfillment of all things. We are therefore to fall in love with the glorious work God is doing in our spouse's life. To his or her future glory. To the way he, he or she will be at the end. That is what we're called to fall in love to. That is what we're called to lead our wives to. Not look at the disappointments or the lacking, but look at what God is doing in his or her life and how far he or she has come in the Lord and where he or she is going. Because ultimately, as I said last week, the, that relationship is temporal. But at the end of it all, we are brothers and sisters in Christ for eternity. The marriage relationship is a reflection. So you may, th so you may think, even for singles, right? A word to the singles in finding your mate. I know you're looking for a spouse who has everything together. One who is low maintenance and does not require a lot of work or self-sacrifice. Go look for somebody that's perfect, right? And maybe that's why some of you are still looking. You may think the person you are courting now is the perfect gentleman who would serve me and love me and die for me and come on a night with a shining armor. Well, I, one of the things I, Connie and I say to married couples is whatever you find cute or very interesting or funny in the person when you're courting or dating, it's going to be an irritation when you're married. <laughs> Believe me. Whatever is cute now will be an irritation after you get married. You see, we are all work in progress. And God has given us this gift of marriage to make us more like Christ. This is called sanctification. It is God's work in us. And therefore, marriage is a gift to us to lead us to that direction. The third is that the marriage relationship is a reflection of the oneness which we have in Christ, right? Uh, it is a strange thing when you become a Christian. The Bible talks about a union with Christ, a oneness, that we will share in His sufferings and in His resurrection. Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. The life I now live, I, I live the, now, the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. The, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. There's a kind of union, a kind of oneness with God. And that is the same oneness that Paul talks about in our marriage. Here Paul translates this truth of the union with Christ to our marriage relationship. Um, look at verse 31 of chapter 5. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife. And the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound. And actually, I'm not talking about marriage. I'm actually talking about Christ and the church, Paul says. This mystery is profound. That the man shall leave his, his father and mother and shall be united with his wife. Hold fast to his wife. Not letting go. This union with our wives occurs really on two levels. This union occurs on two levels. Husbands and wives physically leave their parents and form a new family unit. In fact, here, it, this is very counterculture as this, as this is quoted from Genesis, but uh, as Paul says this, in that, in that culture of a paternalistic culture, the man, the wife would leave the home, get married, and they would live in the, in the, in the uh, f husband's uh, household. But he says, no, the man shall leave his father and mother. Notice it says that. The man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife. In other words, the man, not the wife gets married into the family and they stay in that, but the man shall leave his father and mother, hold fast to his wife, and they will become one family unit. That's biblical marriage. So husbands will physically leave their parents, forming a family unit. As Moses wrote in Genesis 2.24, it was considered counterculture, as I said. But God said in Genesis when he ordained the first marriage that man shall leave his father and mother and they would form a new community in Christ. And because we are sinful creatures under the fall, you remember Genesis 3.16, our desire is not for one another but to seek our own way. We seek our own good. We are selfish. We are self-centered. We seek to cover our own idols, our own pride, our own shame as mentioned in Genesis 3.16. And so when two families come together, they're not going to be naturally saying, oh, what do you like? Oh, what do you like? No, we'll be bringing our own values from both families. 
and coming together. And that is why there's going to be a struggle. Due to the fall, the curse of the sin in our lives will mar our marriages. But Paul says, no, no. Leave your family to form a new unit under Christ. But this, as I said, will have problems um, because of the two family units that come together with two separate values. I tell you a story of Tim and Kathy Keller from the book Meaning of Marriage. That's a great book also. So uh, if you get your hands on it, read that. The Meaning of Marriage by Tim Keller. But yeah, in there he tells us of a story. Uh, one day Tim was playing with his son. Uh, the son was still very young at that time, many years ago. And then he comes out with a dirty diaper. And so what does Tim do? Tim Keller goes and calls his wife. Kathy, son has uh, pooped, dirty diaper. And Kathy Keller says, you know in my house... In my household, find us keepers. You can clean it. And, and, uh, and then Tim found himself seething in anger. Why? But here's a bit of a background story. You see, Kathy's mother, Kathy Keller's mother, had a stroke when she was in her 40s. And her father stepped in to do many household chores, and which was not typical for families back then, for a man to do certain chores like do the laundry or do the dishes. Um, her mother was grateful and admired her husband's love and humility. So she could hear her mother say, this is how my husband loves me. He helps me with the chores and children. In Tim's household, however, his father would often work long hours and would often come home tired. His mother was grateful that he worked hard to provide a comfortable family life. And she would expect him to do nothing around the house. Tim would hear his mother say, this is how I love your father. He works so hard. He provides for the family. So when he comes home, I don't want him to do anything like change the diapers. or any- I do everything for him. Well, you know, Tim Keller did change the diaper. But what was Tim hearing when Kathy told him to change the diaper himself? He heard her saying, she didn't love me. She didn't think I worked hard enough. And when Tim asked Kathy to change the diaper, Kathy, what was Kathy hearing? It's a woman's work. He's saying it's a woman's work. It's not really important enough, right? He, he thinks he's worked hard outside, but he doesn't know how hard life is here. And Kathy was saying at a semi-conscious level, if you love me the way my father loved my mother, you would change the diaper. And Tim was saying in his heart, if you love me the way my mother loved my father, you wouldn't be asking me to do this. And so you see how the two family values come together with that kind of expectation, but they're missing each other in, in love, in expression of love for, towards each other. Each one heard the other say, I don't love you. Because each was failing to get love in that particular way. God is saying that, we, that both are leaving. The man shall leave his father and mother and the woman, likewise, to form something new, to become one family unit, one flesh, one body. And so, when the Bible talks about one flesh, the second thing I, I was going to say was that, um, let's see, okay, the second thing was that um, one flesh is that one, it's as a, there's a physical union, okay? But let's go back to the text that we read last week, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Uh, reading from verse 2 to verse 5. 1 Corinthians 7, verse 2 to verse 5. But because of the temptation to sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife and each woman her own husband. To the husband, the husband should give to his wife her conjugal rights, and likewise the wife to her husband. For the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. Likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Do not deprive one another except perhaps by agreement for a limited time that you may devote yourself to prayer, but then come together again so that Satan may not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. When the Bible talks about two becoming one flesh, it talks about a communion of two separate people into a union or a oneness. Now what I'm about to say may be a little bit uncomfortable, but it is deeply spiritual and has deep spiritual consequences. So listen, even for singles, right? 
Marriage is a covenant we make between each other. A contract, an agreement. And in 1 Corinthians 7, obviously because of verse 2, it says because uh, each man should have his own wife and each woman her own husband, it means that uh, sexual intimacy, the gift of sex, is within the marriage covenant. Right? Each man must have his own wife and wife his own husband. Marriage is a covenant that we make between each other. It's not a contract. You see, a contract is an agreement between two people. Uh, you bring your part in, I bring my part in. A covenant, however, is a pledge to, f a pledge, uh, to you and how I will plan to fulfill it. It's my covenant to you. And God made covenant with His people. He pledged to give Himself to His people and He goes about fulfilling His covenant with us. The Bible is full of covenant promises and covenant renewal ceremonies. When God enters into a personal relationship with someone, He's not unrealistic as to think that mere emotion can serve as the basis for it. He knows that human emotion comes and goes, and there needs to be something more binding to provide consistency and endurance. So, for example, He makes a covenant with the people of uh, Israel in freeing them and taking them out of Egypt. He gives them the Passover. Every year, uh, Jews remember this, Passover, as a, as a covenant as to remember God's covenant to His people. It's a covenant renewal ceremony that the Jews would have to pass over. The ultimate covenant renewal ceremony for Christians is the Lord's Supper. The sacrament of the Lord's Supper renews the covenant made at baptism. Through the breaking of bread and the pouring out of wine, it reenacts re the selfless sacrifice of Jesus to His people. How Jesus moved and gave up everything, emptied Himself, came to the cross for us. And the covenant renewal ceremony is the Lord's Supper that we partake of every week, every month to remember what Christ has done for us. Because just on mere emotions, we will forget. Just on mere uh, reading of the Scripture, we will forget. But the Lord's Supper reminds us again of Christ and His work on the cross. In the same way, brothers and sisters, Marriage is a covenant we make to our spouses. Sexual intimacy is a covenant renewal ceremony for marriage. The physical reenactment of the inseparable oneness in all other areas of economic, legal, personal, psychological, which is created by marriage, the marriage covenant. Sex therefore renews and revitalizes the marriage covenant. And in light of this, I, I want to make two points. 1 Corinthians chapter 7 being 1, that each man will have his own wife and each woman has her husband. But verse 3 says, the husband should give to his wife her conjugal rights and likewise the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And before you think this is a sexist marriage, the verse goes on to say, likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. And isn't this what oneness is? Isn't this what not one flesh means? That I don't have right over my own body, but that we as husband and wife have rights over each other, own body. This is the one flesh that the Bible talks about. And this is where I, was, I speak pastorally. We as Asians are very pragmatic people. We are utilitarian. A bit like, Greek, like the Greeks in Paul's time. Sex is for posterity. And many marriages are sexless. Sex is just, sex, sexual intimacy is to have children. And you're not partaking in the gift of marriage which God has ordained for you because you have lost maybe the romance. And you know it's exactly like the Lord's Supper, isn't it? You cannot partake of the Lord's Supper when you have an issue with another brother or sister. There's just this discomfort. And when you come to the Lord's Supper, you need to make right. Well, husband and wife, there are issues in your life that has been going on for months or years and you have not dealt with it and this affects you. This affects your gift that God has given you of sexual intimacy. When you have something in your marriage that is an issue that you haven't resolved, that you haven't talked about, it's hard, isn't it, to be in this covenant renewal ceremony. Well, if that is true, I ask you to discuss this together as husband and wife this week or today and this afternoon with your covenant partner to see how you can bring back the laughter 
Bring back the fun, the jesting, the craziness. Bring back the love back into your marriage relationship. It happens in a lot of marriages. And I, and I had to work through this myself. But this is important. You remember I quoted, the second point is that, you remember I quoted Sam Alvary and I mentioned this, that if marriage shows us the shape of the gospel, singleness shows us its sufficiency. This is it. This is the shape of the gospel. Christ and His church. Oneness. One flesh. He gave Himself up completely to be one with His church. He remains chaste, now waiting in heaven, sanctifying His church for the final consummation when she shall return for us. And in here, there's a message for singles as well. You see, marriage is deeply spiritual. Marriage is deeply spiritual. It's just not just two personalities coming together, learning to live together, uh, each contributing his or her part in selfless living. That's a contract, right? Husband and wife make a contract and then they can break it at any time they want. That's how the world lives. Marriage is covenantal because it is not ultimately about sex or social stability or personal fulfillment or having children. Marriage was created to be a human reflection of the ultimate love relationship with the Lord. It is meant to be a reflection of the ultimate love relationship with the Lord. And so that is why it's important for us not to live our marriages under the curse anymore but to put it through the cross of Christ, redeemed by the gospel of Jesus Christ, made new and made right in Ephesians chapter 5. And he gives us three points, three ways to do that. It is deeply spiritual. It shows us the shape of the gospel, the reversal of the curse. My question is this to singles. How then can we do this covenant? How then can we do this covenant dance? with one who does not share the same understanding of the gospel of Jesus Christ, an unbeliever. How? Inclu Next slide. Because of the covenant that we have made to one another, because it's deeply spiritual, because it's not just a physical coming together of two flesh, but because there is the covenant renewal ceremony that makes us one flesh. This is the reason John Piper says this again in his momentary marriage, and I quote, Staying married, therefore, is not mainly about staying in love. You think, oh, it's all about love. No, it's not mainly about staying in love. It's about keeping covenant till death do us part, or as long as we both shall live is a sacred covenant promise, the same kind Jesus made with his bride when he died for her. Therefore, what makes divorce and remarriage so horrific in God's eyes is not merely that it involves covenant breaking to the spouse, but it misrepresents Christ and His covenant. Marriage and divorce is so horrific in God's eyes is not merely that it involves covenant breaking, but that it misrepresents Christ and His covenant. Christ will never leave His wife, ever. There may be times of painful distance and tragic backsliding on our part, but Christ keeps His covenant forever. Marriage is a display of that. Marriage is about portraying something true about Jesus Christ. Amen? That is what our marriages are meant to be. And in closing, Tim Keller says, the gospel shows us the true marriage that our soul needs and the true family our hearts want. This is what we all want and desire. No marriage can ultimately give us what we most desire and truly need. Even Christian marriages will struggle and will fail and will fall if you lack the love relationship with Christ. If we do not come as singles or as married people, if we are not contented in Christ, if we do not find our identity and our security in Christ, then we're going to find it in each other. We're going to find it in our spouse. We're going to demand from our spouse that, that he or she fulfills me of what only God can do in my life. And that is what is going to destroy our marriages. When we desire and we take from each other only what God can give. But what true biblical marriage, gospel-centered marriage is, is giving. Is giving of our lives. 
That is what that is how Christ taught the church. It is of giving and giving of each other. And so if we don't have if we don't have the gospel, we will put expectations on marriage and on each other to fulfill what God only can fulfill. If marriage is the shape of the gospel, and it is, then singleness shows its sufficiency. This whole reversal of the curse in the finished work of Christ is what gives us hope in our marriages. Our hope as married people is Christ and His gospel, making us the new creature in Him, no longer slaves to sin, but free in Christ. Let us pray.